Fritzing parts fast. PCB view, part two. In the last part, we used a shortcut method of using Fritzing to draw stuff that got pasted into our drawing. But another shortcut method is to use the breadboard drawing. Our PCB drawing is supposed to be an accurate one-to-one -one life size drawing. And technically, our breadboard drawing should be the same because it's supposed to be real life. And that means if you drew it accurately, you just have to delete stuff and change stuff. Of course, you still have to do your through hole rings like in the last video and snap it in place. But if your breadboard drawing is using plain through hole rings with our pins, this would have already been done. In theory, you could leave the objects on the drawing and just make them invisible by removing the stroke and fill. But this makes the drawing file size bigger than it should be. Basically, you should be able to make one from the other because they're that similar. Next, we'll cover the manual method of actually drawing objects. Drawing ring pads. Select the circle, hold the control key down, snap click to one grid point and drag it to another snap grid point. This is a stroke and we want it gold, so we hold the shift key down and click on gold. Now we need to work out our sizes. If we go in Fritzing and grab a generic header, we can see the hole is 1mm and the ring thickness is 0.508mm. Fritzing uses a generic hole that's on the large size, in case you get one of those few parts with a large pin. And it is adequate, but the correct way is to get the data sheet and use what they recommend. So we go to our stroke style and punch in the number we want. I'm going to round it to 0.5mm to make it easy. Now we go arrow select. Now to get a 1mm hole with a half a millimetre stroke on each side means that this has to be 2mm. So we hit the padlock and punch in 2mm. Just snap it to the midpoint. Now if we look at the XML, it's a circle with an ID of path. But let's now duplicate it. If the duplicate button is not visible, just click on something else and click back. Now if we look at the duplicate, it's a circle with an ID of circle. We'll just move this here. Let's now draw another one. So we hit the circle button. Hold the control key down, click on the grid and drag to another grid. Stroke 0.5. Hold the shift and hit gold. Back to the arrow button. And as an example, we'll unlock it. And punch in 2mm width and 1.99mm height. So it's not perfectly round. This one says ellipse, but an ID of path as well. But if we duplicate that, it says ellipse, ellipse. We'll just move that here. Let's now make a fritzing part out of this and see the difference between circle, ellipse and those paths. In Fritzing, there's an indicator that there's something wrong because it looks weird, but that's not an indicator that it won't work, as we'll see later. We made our Fritzing part, exported the Gerber and opened it in a Gerber viewer, and we have our two circles with ID path and circle, and our two ellipses with ID path and ellipse. Now look what happens when I toggle the drill layer, which indicates actual drill holes, and it shows in manufacturing the circles will be drilled, but not the ellipses. And this shows that the ID name is not an indicator if a hole will be drilled, because a circle or an ellipse can both have an ID name of path, so look at what the object is, and remember only a circle will be drilled. Next is custom copper pad shapes, like squares and ovals. Squares are pretty easy, just hit the rectangle button, click on a grid point and drag it to another grid point. Hold the shift key down and click on gold. Back to arrow select. Lock the width and height. Punch in the size you want. I'll use 2mm, same as our ring. We'll just snap that to a midpoint. Now you want no fill, but you want the stroke. Then you punch in a stroke width that makes this center hole bigger than the drill hole in your ring pad. The way these custom pads works is you put your circle pad down first and you slip these custom pads underneath it. And that means you don't want your custom pad holes smaller than the drill hole. I'm going to use half a mil, but smaller would be better. If you do things in the wrong order in Inkscape, the stroke width could change the object size. So we have to set this back to 2mm. Ovals are difficult to draw, and to tell the truth, I don't actually draw them. With ovals, it's too easy to make a fritzing part that looks like it's working, but then goes totally haywire when you try to make a Gerber out of it. It might not actually be possible to draw an oval in Inkscape because of the way it converts objects to XML code. At least I couldn't get it to work reliably. So I usually get my ovals out of fritzing 2020 parts like MOSFETs and regulators. I also get the square pads that way too. Then just copy and paste the ovals out of the parts SVG. Fritzing groups for a PCB drawing was covered in detail in the last video, so go watch that. But the quick refresher so you can follow the next bit is... You want silk screen on the top, then a copper below that, and a copper inside that copper. I've copied and pasted in my squares and ovals. I had to resize my ovals with the usual arrow button toolbar height and width. Now let's move our custom pads to the rings. Currently our custom pads are above our circles. Lowering the XML table is a higher level. But let's change the levels and see what happens. We have our first circle, and we want our first rectangle under it. So we have to raise it above it on the XML table. Our second circle, we want its rectangle on top of it. So we move it under the circle in the XML. And we'll just raise this free rectangle to separate the rectangles from the ovals. For our next circle, we want the oval pad under it, so we move it above it. For the last circle, we want the oval on top of it, which it already is. And our single oval is by itself. Just note our custom pad is under the ring here, over the ring here, this is by itself, under, over, and by itself. 
Now let's make a fritzing part out of this and see the effects of the different levels. The first thing we notice in fritzing is some of the pads look strange. Our first pad looks normal because it has the gradient colour rings we expect. And it's the one with the rectangle under the circle. Our second connector has a rectangle above the circle and it looks strange. This will work but it's not the way you should do it. Our rectangle on its own also looks strange. Our oval under the ring looks normal. But the oval on top of our ring looks a bit odd. The rectangle shows the oval was selected and not the ring. And that's because you can't select the ring when it's under another object. And our oval by itself looks like the previous one. But now let's see what the manufacturing Gerber says. In our Gerber our drill holes are red. I'll just toggle it on and off. And we can see only the pads with the circles on them actually got drilled. The pads by themselves don't have actual drill holes. And this tells you it's critical to have a circle in the XML code if you want a drilled hole. Next we have plain drill holes. Drill holes are exactly like ring pads. In that they have to be a circle and they have to be in copper. The only difference is the stroke width has to be zero. We have our three ring circles and it's easier selecting the circle and punching in zero for the stroke width. Then resizing it to what we want. And you probably would have guessed the next problem, it's invisible. So what they usually do is fill it, usually using black. Now the problem with this is the object is in the copper and we'll see what happens with it later. Let's now give our third circle zero stroke and resize it. And the better method is to duplicate that and fill it. Then put that duplicate circle in the silk screen. If the groups don't have transforms, it's as easy as indenting it out, lifting it up under the silk screen and indenting it in. If the fill ever gets lost from the zero stroke circle, just click on it and copy these numbers into the fill circle. Now let's make a fritzing part and see the results. Back in fritzing, we can now see our black filled circle that was in the copper group is now copper. And that's what fritzing does with any object that has fill or stroke that's in the copper group. And that's what this guy did wrong with his drawing. But our non-filled circle with duplicate black circle in silk screen looks better. Let's now see what the Gerber shows. In the Gerber we can see our three drill holes, coloured red here. But let's see what happens when we turn them off. Our drill holes are now copper circles. This should be okay in manufacturing because the copper circle gets drilled out. But if we turn on our drill layer again, you might be able to see a slight sliver of copper poking from behind the hole. And that's what might happen if there's a slight misalignment with the drill. If you want to fix that and not have an object show in the copper, just give the object an ID name of non-com with a number on the end. Both of our holes are now non-coms. Now let's see what happens when you make a part out of it. In fritzing it looks exactly the same, but now in the Gerber, if we turn off the drill, it doesn't have copper circles. Basically the best method is to give your zero stroke no fill circle the no copper ID non-com name and put a duplicate black filled circle in silk screen over it. Let's now make some surface mount pads. And first we'll start with the rectangle. And we'll try for 1mm by 4mm. So we want fill. If it's not gold, click the gold button. But we don't want stroke. We click the arrow button and we see our dimensions are correct at 1mm by 4mm. We'll now duplicate that and move it over here. Now let's make a pad with a line. So hit the pencil button. Just click on one grid and then click on another grid. I'll make this one shorter so you can discern the difference between the two sets. Because it's a stroke we hold shift and click on gold. Go to stroke style and punch in one millimeter wide. Then as a quick experiment we're going to hit square cap. We'll quickly resize that so we hit the arrow button and select three millimeters. Inkscape changes to 3.25 millimeters because of an internal preference that's set at default. Then punch in zero for the Y and four millimeters for the X. Then we just right click, duplicate and move it to 6mm on the X. Now let's make a part out of this and see what happens. The first thing we do is box select, then it's object and group. And because it's a surface mount that only has pads on the top layer, we have to rename the group copper 1. The problem is, Fritzing will complain if there isn't a copper group inside the copper group. So while the group is selected, go object, group again. We then open that group, select copper 1 and unindent it out. Then raise copper 1 above the other group. We select the other group and rename it copper 0. Then it's just a matter of selecting it and indenting copper zero into copper one. Our pads are now only in copper one top layer and our empty copper zero is inside so fritzing doesn't complain. Next we'll quickly make a body for our dummy part. So we'll select the rectangle and draw a rectangle underneath. Then it's object and group. Select that group and rename it silk screen. Select it, then unindent it out of copper zero and raise it to above copper one. Then it's arrow button, box select, edit and resize page to selection. Then it's the usual file, save as, plain SVG. In fritzing we need a 4 pin part to match our 4 pins, so we grab a header and give it 4 pins. Then we right click edit part. Then it's go to PCB, then it's file, load image for view. Select our SVG and open. Oddly enough, we put our pads in our copper 1 group in the SVG because we only want them on the top layer. 
but in fritzing it will put the pads on both layers unless we tell it it's an SMD part and the way you change that is go to the connectors and tick the SMD global box. You can also change all the pins to male or female. You can even change pins individually here. In fritzing pins have internal genders with male having a red pin indicator colour and female no colour. And it's the same in all views, male red, female no colour. Male red, female no colour. But the thing is the internal pin gender is not the part gender. This part shows as female but internally it has the red male connectors. Next we assign our pins so it's PCB. We select a pin in the table and hit select graphic and click the pin we want. Usually you leave the trace anchor point in the centre for SMD as shown by the crosshair because you usually have a straight section of trace and turn it on the outside of the part. But if you want to change it just select the compass point after you've assigned it. Then it's just file, save as new part. We drag it in, then it's file, export, for production, extended Gerber. Then just save it in a folder. And the first thing we get is there's no copper zero in the export. I don't know why they put this error message in Fritzing and the misleading copper zero reference, but this copper zero refers to the PCB not having anything on the copper zero bottom layer, not the part. So just press the OK. Same with mask and paste. Open Gerber V and then it's file, open layers. Open the Gerber group, then click hold the bottom one and drag to the top. Then go to the layers tabs and turn off mask and paste so you can see more clearly. And the first thing we notice is the line strokes have rounded ends when we selected square ends. And that's because Inkscape keeps the old code and blanks it, but Fritzing reads it anyway and draws it. And that means it's safer to use rectangles. If we now go to our layer table, you'll see there's no bottom layers. And if we turn off copper top, we see we only have top pads, which is what we want. I won't go through setting up Inkscape and drawing the PCB rectangle because it was covered in part 4 and 1, so go watch those. But you should have a rectangle of the correct size, 0 0 so it's inside the grid. But now we'll position our pads using the same method as we did in schematic part 3, i.e. set the grid and snap it to the grid. I know my part has its pins on 100 thou grid, that's even the support pins, and that's in both the X and Y direction. Then it's File, Document Properties, go to Grids, remove the last one, add a new one, change to Inch, then just punch in 0.1 inch in the X and 0.1 inch in the Y. Now we have to work out our offsets. From the last video we worked out it's 2.25mm from the edge of the PCB to the centre of the pin. We change this back to millimetres and we punch in our 2.25mm. If the grid doesn't move and you're on Inkscape version 1, you might have to plus zoom in and minus zoom out to get it to redraw. If you're on Inkscape 0.9, you might have to enter a 1 first before the 2.25mm. Now we know the PCB is 66mm high and the outside of the pins are 2.1 inches apart, which is 53.34mm, making it 66 minus 53.34 divided by 2 equals 6.33mm from the top edge down to the centre of the pin. So we go to the Y origin and punch in our 6.33 and that major grid line is this darker one down here. Next select the midpoint snap button, then just grab your ring pad and drag it to the snap point. You can then Ctrl D duplicate and drag it to the next spot, or box select, Ctrl D duplicate and then move that over. You can even use the coordinate method of Ctrl D duplicate, change to inch and then add 200 thou to the X. We're only moving 2 pins so it's 200 thou. We've done our 25 pins so it's just box select, Ctrl D duplicate and just drag it where we want it. Then box select both of those, Ctrl D duplicate and then drag that to where you want it. I do my support pins the same way. Mine has a square on pin number 1, so we move that over. And we duplicate that and put it on pin number 50 as well. Then it's a matter of box selecting all the pins. Then it's object and group, and then object and group again. Then it's a matter of renaming the parent group copper 1, and the inside group copper 0. Next we have to make sure our square pads are under our circle pads, so we have to move them at the top of this table. Higher on the table is actually a lower layer. One is in the right place, but we have to find the other, and send it to the bottom. Both our rectangles are now at the top. Pin assignment was covered in part 1, so go watch that. But the quick version is, you can leave these circles the way they are and assign them in fritzing. But if you ever have to bring this drawing back into another part, you'll have to reassign all those pins again. So the best method is to click on the pin and change its ID to the auto assign format. Connector, numbers starting from 0 and then pin. Then it's just a matter of right clicking on it and going copy. Select the next pin, then right click paste and change the number. Basically if pin PA3 is connector number 6 in one drawing, PA3 has to be connector 6 in all drawings. We've assigned all our pin numbers in the same order as the other drawings. Now we can add silkscreen extras, like our rectangular boxes. Here I'm turning off the snap to reposition it. Then it's Ctrl D duplicate and add 2 inches to the Y. I finished all my rectangles so I make a silkscreen group and shuffle them all inside with the usual indent and the raise and lower. Next we need our text. I'm not going to tell you how to make text here because that was covered in part 2 and I'm not going to tell you how to copy and paste it in because that was covered in part 3 and 4. So go watch those. Just remember you have to go into every individual piece of text and remove the first instance of PX. Of course do this last just before you save the drawing. 
Our drawing is finished, so it's the usual file, save as plain SVG. Then it's the usual edit your part, go to PCB view, and then load your drawing. And ignore the font warning. Text and everything looks alright, and all our pads are assigned. So it's the usual save part. In the next part we'll be tidying up loose ends and checking the part to make sure it works properly.